Representative Takano is, as you might imagine, a very busy man, but he values 3D printing so much that he has graciously taken a few minutes to address you all here today. So I will turn over the, the microphone to Representative Takano. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Is there anyone here who can 3D print a new air conditioning system? <laughs> oh my God, this is part of the capital. Jeez. Uh, well, I want to thank Public Knowledge and Fractured Atlas for hosting this event. So thank you very much, both of you, both those organizations. As the co-chair of the Congressional Maker Caucus, a bipartisan group of lawmakers working uh, to support the maker movement. It is my privilege uh, to uh, talk to you today about 3D printing, one of the fastest growing and most empowering, empowering maker technologies. A visit to Vocademy, a maker space in my district, first sparked my interest uh, in the maker movement and 3D printing. I'm amazed by how much the technology has advanced since then. That was about three years ago. Now it is possible to print in glass, metal, and even rock. Uh, rock? Um, the last year when NASA astronauts realized they needed a specific tool, they printed it up in space. 3D printing is part of the revolution in manufacturing that is transforming our lives. Children are designing and printing their own toys. In fact, we have a congressman who says to his own children, you can't have toys unless you make them. Um, that's true. Um, families are personalizing their homes with their own creations. Sculptors are using CAD and printers to create original artwork. And makers are becoming entrepreneurs and taking their freshly printed ideas into the marketplace. This technology is even helping NGOs create affordable prosthetics for children. But we cannot capture the full value of 3D printing without a highly trained workforce that can fill these highly, these high-tech specialized jobs. I believe that training should begin before high school graduation, and we should offer students the training certifications and internships that, uh, that prepare them for these jobs. Educators have the means to teach these skills through maker spaces set up in, in community centers, classrooms, and libraries. In addition to learning technical skills such as CAD, students who participate in making activities learn collaboration, communication, and entrepreneurship, skills valued by, entrepreneurs, uh, by employers. Learning through making will help fill jobs and companies that need workers who are trained to think differently about design and can work with multiple disciplines. Now I saw the future last month on a tour of a University of California Riverside lab where researchers are creating 3D printed building blocks that can be assembled to create custom instruments for biological and chemical testing. These instruments can replace far more expensive medical equipment not readily available in developing countries. If policymakers can come together in support of this technology, it will be a catalyst that redefines manufacturing and creates jobs here in America. I said this last year, but it remains true this year. I am the only member of Congress <laughs> with a 3D printer in his office. <laughs> Now, I am raising the bar and introducing the first and only congressional Thingiverse page, where you can download and print 3D, it's true, 3D, 3D files that we've created. Today, I'd like to unveil the first 3D printed product that I'm putting up on that page. Uh, it is a plaque that reads, Give Judge Garland a vote. <laughs> Now go and check it out for yourself. Uh, even better, print it out, put it on your desk, uh, and share the photo online. Thank you for being here today and being a part of this movement. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Congressman. We really appreciate you taking the time. We have two more panels left uh, before we wind down the panel programming session in 3DDC 2016. Um, this panel I'm very excited about. Um, it focuses on 3D printing and bridging the workforce skills gap. We've got a really dynamic uh, series of panelists here, and I will turn things over to my public knowledge colleague, Dallas Harris. Take it away, Dallas. Maybe we can get uh, someone in here to print Representative Takata one of those famous uh, red pens for him to use <laughs> next time he marks up something. <laughs> oh, all right, so we're just going to jump straight into it. We don't have much time. I'm going to go ahead and let everyone introduce themselves, and then we'll get right to the questions. First, we have Diego Tamburini, and he's from Autodesk. Diego. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Diego uh, from Autodesk. For those who don't know Autodesk, uh, we are a software company. We develop uh, software tools for anybody who wants to design and make things, uh, ranging from the enterprise to the maker in, in his or her garage. Uh, of course, uh, by being in this uh, industry, manufacturing, uh, we are very much into 3D printing, and uh, we have uh, tools and, and uh, uh, software platforms to, to help uh, with 3D printing. Great, thank you so much. Oh, and sorry. Oh, and I should mention that we, we're also very uh, invested in, uh, in skills and, and training, and uh, uh, proof of that is that all of our software is uh, available for free for uh, students, uh, academic institutions, uh, or uh, academic uh, teachers, so of all levels. So for those students in the room, uh, give it a try. All right, next we have Charlie Wapner from the American Library Association. Thanks, I'm Charlie Wapner. I'm a senior information policy analyst with the American Library Association's Office for Information Technology Policy. I know that's a mouthful. Um, I, uh, our interest in 3D printing stems from the fact that 3D printing is rapidly taking off as a service in libraries, and libraries are increasingly providing this service at no, at low or no cost to the public. Um, and so, from our perspective, from I work in ALA's policy office, we're focused on the po elucidating the policy implications of 3D printing in the library context, so that we can position our community to play a leading role in shaping the policy frameworks that are just now beginning to take shape around this technology. But People on the ground, uh, like Adam, are very invested in building workforce skills through this technology, and we're um, looking to be a partner with librarians on the ground, so it's a good opportunity to be here and hear about what's going on on the ground in uh, DC Public, too. Great, and that leads perfectly into Adam Schaefer, who works at the MLK Library here in DC. Adam! Hello, my name is Adam. Uh, I work on the street. My name is Adam. I work down the street uh, for DC Public Library at the MLK branch. I help run our makerspace there in the library, uh, which all of you with DC library cards can come and access. Uh, we see we don't see that many people every day because it's a really tiny room, but we do three orientations a week. Each orientation has about 30 people. I think we've oriented over like five or 600 people so far, so that's how many people have the ability to come through and start actually reserving time on our machines with their library cards. So instead of checking out a book, you check out a printer, you check out time on the scanner, or the laser, or the, the mill, or, or whatever it is you want to do. So um, my role is, some, somebody on one of the panels earlier said something about how we need like the Willy Wonka in each space to show you all the machines. I really feel like that dude. Like, I'm the Willy Wonka dude in the lab, and I'll show you where everything is and what it does, and maybe get you started. And then after that, you're kind of, kind of on your own. But, yeah, so come see me down the street if you get some free time. Great, thank you. And to my left, we've got Gaston Merrill uh, from Tech Shop. Yay! <laughs> Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, Gaston Merrill, Tech Shop, DC Arlington. Uh, Tech Shop is a national chain of uh, makerspaces, uh, membership based workshop. It can be a prototyping studio, fabrication lab, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we have about a million dollars worth of tools and software. And anyone who wants to can come into the shop, can take classes uh, on how to use any of our machines, and then they can build whatever they want. Uh, so our slogan is build your dreams here, and we like to make that happen every day. 
Great, and last but certainly not least, we have Robin Giuliano from the National Economic Council at the White House. Hi, I'm Robin Giuliano, Senior Policy Advisor at the White House for the National Economic Council. Um, what we do there, and to be honest, I didn't know what they did until I got there, so if you're wondering, um, I was too. Um, we coordinate um, economic policy across the federal government for the president, so making sure his agenda is implemented across all of the federal agencies. Um, and actually, directly before that, I worked here in the House of Representatives, um, so it's really great to be back. All right, welcome back. So, uh, let's go ahead and just get right into it. Diego, if you could, from the manufacturing perspective, what does the, the skills gap look like? Right? What kind of skills do you notice that employees are, are lacking? Sure. So, I, I speak to, to manufacturing in general, and, and many of the, the, the remarks I'm going to make apply to 3D printing. So, but it's, it's really about digital manufacturing and the advanced manufacturing and the new factory floor but uh, and it also applies to 3d printing which is the the, the topic here so that there are there are two main areas that are going to require like a reshuffle of the skills needed there is the 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 group that develops or designs the things that are going to be 3d printed so 3d printing really changes the, the approach uh, towards design because it's very different to design something for 3D printing than it is to design it to, to uh, 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 subtractive manufacturing or traditional methods, uh, injection molding, etc. So that mentality needs to change and also understand uh, what are the right things to, to 3D print, right? I mean, just as I, I wouldn't barbecue my ribs in the microwave, uh, you, you, you wouldn't do everything with the 3D printed. So get, as the technology matures, you have to, uh, the, our workforce has, needs to understand the difference. The other group is the one that uh, actually operates the 3D printers. It's usually the, the worker who's actually in the factory floor uh, who used to probably operate other types of machines. So that group is arguably the, the most impacted by the skills gap right now. Because, the, uh, first of all, uh, these are complex machines, uh, particularly 3D printers. I mean, don't, don't, we, in the factory floor, you don't have the, the desktop maker bots. You have these big machines that look like scary computers. So the, the operator of these machines, they need to know uh, uh, to a decent level uh, computer programming, uh, computer-aided design, uh, digital uh, numerical control, things like G-code and whatnot. So those are things that are relatively new to this force. 3D printing uh, uh, specifically is unique in that it doesn't have a counterpart in the old world. So for example, today, numer numerically control milling machines or lathes or, or jet cutters, they have a counterpart in the manual old world. 3D printers were born in the di digital, so there isn't, a, there isn't a skill that is transferable, it's completely new. So to close my, uh, my answer, uh, specific skills, uh, of course there is the stuff that you can teach in school or vocation, vocational uh, colleges or, or uh, community colleges, use the, the tools to design, uh, uh, operate the 3D printers, but more profoundly the, the the intellectual level of the, the new worker in the manufacturing needs to be higher, more analytical, more creative. Uh, it, it requires a different level of intellect if you want to, for example, figure out why this part didn't 3D print uh, correctly. So, so things like that, and, and of course, I mean, things like in the maker movement and, and kids printing things in their local libraries, that's fantastic. I mean, that's gonna go a long way towards uh, at least getting people really interested in, in manufacturing, digital manufacturing, and more specifically 3D printing. Great, thank you. Um, Charlie, Diego kind of got into this just a little bit at the end of his answer mm -hmm. there, but libraries are, um, you know, staple institutions in our communities. What role do you see libraries playing in helping bridge this, this work gap? Yeah, I think it all revolves around libraries as these in, informal learning labs. So 
it's useful to juxtapose what libraries do to what the school would do with a 3D printer. 3D printers are taking off in schools too. The difference is when you're using a 3D printer in a school, it's usually in connection with the established lesson plan of an instructor. When you're in a library, you're not beholden to the strictures of an instructor's lesson plan. So you're free to use a 3D printer in pursuit of learning whatever it is you're personally interested in. And I, I personally believe that 3D printing anything uh, builds important workforce development skills because you're learning how to create a CAD model, you're learning how to uh, manipulate plating and slicing software, you're learning how to just generally translate a digital model into a physical object. If you happen to be doing that in connection with something you're personally invested in, then, the, then the, I think the, the learning that happens as a result of that, the skills that you cultivate as a result of that, the neural connections that you build in the process actually become stronger. Um, if you move back up to 10,000 feet, beyond just 3D printing, libraries offer a, scores of classes and, and other activities around how to build, how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter, uh, you know, how to, how to interview well, how to use social media in a professional environment. And we do it in a very non-judgmental, non-competitive atmosphere. The difference between libraries, incubators and accelerators do these things too, but the difference is in libraries, again, it's non-competitive, but it's also we're universal, we're ubiquitous. We're in every community, every state, every county, every city, every school district. So we're not just in urban centers like accelerators and incubators, but we're in rural areas and urban areas and everywhere in between. We're in high income areas and low income areas and everywhere in between. So it's this universe, it's this universality uh, coupled with this you know, non-judgmental and non-competitive atmosphere overlaying with uh, these uh, digital technologies like 3D printers and laser cutters and CNC routers that are taking off in libraries now that I think set libraries apart as uh, centers for workforce development. Great, yeah, libraries clearly have an important role to play here. Um, Adam, so you have these, the hands-on teaching experience at the MLK library. Can you tell us about the classes? Uh, what kind of questions do you get from people, right? Uh, what are some reactions that you get from people who are new to 3D printing? So, depending on the age group, uh, the questions can be very different. So, if I'm working with kindergartners, the question is, you know, when can I have one? <laughs> and then if I'm working with, like, uh, I do programs with AARP, and they'll be like, where does the paper go in the printer? So, it could be anything in between those two things. But, that's when I go out of the library. When I'm in the library, those classes are more stimulating because it's all those age groups sort of mixed together. So I might have a grandfather with his grandson. Uh, I might have a bunch of kids fulfilling like a school requirement. Um, some people that just wandered in off the street. Uh, and the, but they'll all be in there together. And it's, I think the one of the biggest problems is establishing a base level of, of computer skills. Because it's like, the when I'm teaching that class, I have to assume a certain level of knowledge. Like, I have to assume you know the difference between a left and a mouse, right mouse click. I know that sounds silly, but I mean, if you didn't grow up with a computer, if I say double click, and they're like, double click what? The mouse. And they're like, this, this, then, yeah, that's the mouse, double click it. And they're like, which one? And I'm like, it's the left one. And I've spent like five minutes explaining the mouse, and they're frustrated, and it becomes this tiny, tiny block becomes this huge uh, obstacle. And I think one of the biggest things I learned teaching these technology classes my first year at the library was you have to anticipate those obstacles and that was particularly difficult from a, a position of, I grew up in a position of privilege. I mean computers were a toy in my house and they were a fun thing to play with. My dad would give me one and say, take it apart. And I was like, what if I break it? He's like, that's great. And I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, I broke a lot of computers, but I learned a lot about them. But if you never had one growing up or if you never had access to one as a toy, um, you didn't have that privilege, and I, I sit you down and I'm like, alright, we're going to learn how to 3D print today, but first you have to design or download this thing from a website, and so if I say to Charlie, Charlie, go uh, go to Chrome, go to Thingiverse, download the STL, and he's going to be like, cool, he's going to do it, probably two minute process, less, depending on his internet connection. <laughs> Hopefully. that I get people in class who I say, alright, sit down on a computer, and go to here to get this model, and I'm like, how do I get to there? And it's like, oh crap, that's, that's a, at one level it's heartbreaking, another it looks, it's a really fun challenge, because now I've got this end goal, and uh, there's a goal post that's not going to move, like, it's a really tangible goal post for this class, but like, at the end of this class, your 
your reward is this 3D printed Yoda figure. And this is what you're going to get. But to get there, you're going to have to learn basic, you know, graphic user interface interactions. Like this is Windows. This is an icon. We're going to double click on this. We're going to learn about the universal resource locator bar. It's like the address on your house. You're going to type in the address. You're going to go there. Now you're going to ask for packets from the internet by clicking on the download link. And then, voila, you have this model. Let's print it. There's you know, the end goal. So um, lots of unexpected teaching happens. Uh, whenever I'm trying to, I'm going to teach you to 3D print, but in the process, we're going to learn all these other things. No, clearly, I just learned what URL stands for. <laughs> I have no idea. Am I the only one? Yeah, apparently. Okay. Uh, is that right? Okay. So, Universal Resource Locator. <laughs> clearly, there's a, a different level of understanding for different groups, and it's not just broken down by age group, but where you might come from, economic status. Um, Gad's been working with a, a particular group of veterans, right? They comprise a large group that are impacted by the skills gap, uh, and Tech Shop has been partnering with the VA. Could you tell us about that partnership and how it's working to reduce the workforce skills gap among veterans? Sure. So uh, Tech Shop fills kind of an interesting space somewhere in between what uh, Adam and Charlie were just describing and what Diego was talking about, where we have uh, a giant playground full of tools and equipment, and anyone can come use that. So we have uh, people who do use professional CNC machines all day long. They're highly skilled. We have people who need to be taught how to save a file. They have no exposure to uh, the technology and the tools they're going to need. Um, so we have a huge range there. and. Uh, Veterans have been a really interesting uh, component of that. So our partnership with the VA, it was the VA uh, Center for Innovation. Uh, they sponsored 2,000 memberships for veterans so they could get a year of access to Tech Shop and $350 uh, in credit for classes. So they can come to the shop, and it's a very simple application process. They would just go online, verify their service through an independent website, and then come to the front desk, sign up, and they're good to go. They're in the door. Um, they can pick whatever classes they want. They can decide on a project for themselves. It was completely self-guided. Uh, and obviously with that, you have a wide range of results. Um, I should say also that GE was in on the partnership too. They also sponsored an additional thousand. And this was in eight locations across the country over the last couple of years. And I'm happy to say they were all awarded, all 3,000 memberships, and it was very successful. Uh, it's some very, very cool results. Uh, but like I was saying, when it's self-guided, you get um, a really interesting mix of, of people, and I think that's probably the coolest thing about it. You have people who want to build a new dining room table, and that is their sole goal, and they don't really care about anything else. Uh, and they learn woodworking, they learn maybe a little bit of digital design, uh, but primarily it's a table. Uh, sometimes they'll come in and they'll have a product already in mind, something that they want to turn into a business. You know, entrepreneurship is uh, a very easy route to go when you have everything in front of you that you need. Uh, you have. Uh, Resources to prototype, like 3D printing in particular. Um, you have, you know, injection molding equipment. You have computer-controlled mills and lathes and all this sort of stuff. Uh, you can produce anything. So we have people who have reinvented themselves to uh, sell crafts that they build in the shop. We have uh, people who have prototyped, uh, you know, electrical adapters so you can charge your cordless power tools uh, all from the same base station. Uh, you know, really a tremendous variety. And Robin, kind of from the, the large-scale federal perspective, can you give us a little taste of what the administration's doing to work to you know, close that workforce skills gap and prepare the American workforce for the economy of the future? Sure. So there are two things that I wanted to highlight. First is um, in 2014, the president called, um, issued a call to action and tasked the vice president with doing a, a massive review of the federal job training programs across the government. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been working in government for a while and can say that there are, one of the challenges is people are in silos. And so you have different agencies, very familiar with their own processes and the populations they serve and the programs they run. Um, and that, you know, there are job training programs at the, through the VA, but there are also, um, is one at the Department of Labor. And we need, to, we need to talk more and we need to align these programs so that, um, 
they, they are making more sense from a holistic perspective. And so as a result of that review, um, a report was issued and a um, presidential memorandum went out to, to, to address this coordination. Um, so that was the first thing. And then the second is that um, some of you might be familiar with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, that's the law that governs our public workforce system. The last time it had been reauthorized, so it was reauthorized in 2014. The, the last time before that was 1998. So a lot had happened, clearly, between um, uh, almost 20 years. And um, one of the really exciting things that that act is doing is it requires coordination across, again, breaking down silos, across education, vocational rehabilitation, um, to, you know, labor, commerce. Uh, it, it brings all of these streams together so that we're looking at these challenges, such as the skills gap, from a multifaceted um, point of view. And you know, some of the most successful and exciting partnerships that I've seen that are um, addressing the skills gap and training people for high demand, high growth jobs with that lead to livable wages, li living wages. Um, you have everyone at the table, and you know it's 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 easy to put that in a law and to say everyone needs to talk, but it's it's difficult to actually make that happen in practice. But I think that is really the secret sauce to making this work. Another piece of that that we're very excited about from um, the administration's point of view is um, increasing access and use of data. There's a lot of data out there um, in the federal databases that um, either is just sitting there is not accessed, um, but could be or is not able to be accessed for a variety of reasons. And you know, when we're talking to a lot of states that are implementing this this new WIOA, which is the acronym for the Workforce Law. Um, now they're hungry for it, which is really exciting because that means they want to know where the jobs are. They want to, businesses want to know where the people are, and so data is the the glue that kind of helps uh, keep this all together. So um, we are the Workforce Innovation Act passed in 2014, but we are in the process of implementing our final regulations. Um, over the next couple of months, um, which will mean you know, the act will really be taking off and, and running. And um, there's a lot of energy and, and, and excitement right now in the field of workforce development as a result of both the vice president's review and um, WIOA. So we're really excited about that. Well, um, please tell the president, the vice president, thank you the next time you see them. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to open up a couple of questions to the whole panel, and then I'll throw it out to you all for a question or two. Um, for anyone who wants to answer, how is 3D printing going to change the way we work? Diego, please. Well, uh, uh, if you listen to the hype in uh, many, many, many ways, uh, 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 but I, I do agree with a lot of it. Uh, uh, <laughs> one of the things uh, that has already impacted the way we work, particularly when we develop products, uh, designers and manufacturers, is the allowing the ability to rapidly prototype your ideas. I mean, that's arguably the most impactful thing right now uh, because it, it just uh, spurs creativity. You get the instant gratification of what you had in the monitor and, and you can touch it and, and uh, discuss it with your peers and potential customers. So that the uh, prototyping is great. The other, the other big uh, uh, impact will be in the nature of things that we design. So uh, the, the shapes that can be achieved with 3D printing are completely different. So you'll see uh, designers uh, uh, designing things that look more organic, that look more natural, and not just because aesthetics, but also because in many cases they perform better, they're lighter. So you'll see progressively the things around us uh, changing uh, because 3D printing has allowed them to, uh, uh, they made it possible. So, so that, uh, uh, like I say, the, 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 as far as the way we work uh, on, on the hype part, the part that I'm, I don't subscribe to is that it's going to replace everything in the factory and our grandmas will be 3D printing stuff in the house, probably. Uh, uh, but but it's, it's just the, the wrong approach, it's, it's the wrong way to view 3D printing. 3D printer at the end of the day is an additional toolbox, uh, a tool in your toolbox. So there are things that will be, uh, uh, you couldn't do before that now you can do with 3D printing, but if I, if I have to produce 100,000 rubber duckies, I will not 3D print them, I, I will still uh, injection mold them. So, so it's, it's it's going to change, of course, for the better. 
in the in the house in your household the whole thing of personal manufacturing the, uh, the, that is called you'll probably see more and more uh, and that's not in the way we work uh, granted but uh, you'll see more people for, for example downloading uh, a, a model from uh, GE appliances to replace something that broke in the refrigerators uh, as opposed to going to Home Depot or going to the GE appliances website and, and talking to someone, I'll just print it, right? So th those things are coming, uh, uh, they're already in, in the most, uh, uh, you know, adventurous uh, type of people, that they're already doing that. Great, anybody else want to yeah. pick that up? Sure. Uh, I agree with pretty much everything Diego just said, but I think they're also valuable in terms of an educational tool, the way you explain something at work. Like is it um, John and Becky, right, who were showing earlier this morning how they printed um, look like some kind of hyperbolic function or a mathematical model that you, you just can't really look at or draw with a pencil and paper. You can print that out and show it to someone and say, look, it's like this. Uh, if you have like a complicated and expensive part that needs to be repaired and you want to show someone at work how to repair it, you might not want to actually take the one out of service and take it apart and risk damaging it. You can print a model of it. You can print, uh, you know, an instructional tool. Uh, it's like a you know three-dimensional lesson. I just wanted to say I think the extent to which uh, 3D printing changes the way we manufacture things will be highly dependent on the extent to which we are we support efforts that are already ongoing. Particularly, um, I'm thinking about uh, the National Additive Manufacturing Institute. So there's a, a facility in Youngstown, Ohio that was the first, uh, it was, it's a national facility dedicated to advancing 3D printing as a, as a manufacturing technique as part of uh, the Obama administration's larger, uh, broader advanced manufacturing initiative and um, it's co-branded as America Makes and America Makes is, has already been, have been working with us and I know with, with others and so you know, these efforts are already underway and I think we need to, we all need, you know, all of us at this table, but probably all of us in this room need to, should get behind that, the, the efforts that are already ongoing. Uh, go ahead, please. <coughs> uh, this is more about uh, the, the prototype to product pipeline, but I think there's a workflow skills. Can you speak up, please, sir? Okay. This, is a, this question is about the pr prototype to product pipeline, but I think there's a workforce skills angle here because you need people with skills to make it possible for someone to design something in a prototype and then push a button and get uh, 100 drop shipped uh, in a nice uh, package uh, for sale. There's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of people need to support that infrastructure. Is there, uh, do you have some thoughts on that pipeline? Hello. Hey. Uh, yes, so we have had, and I was surprised, we have had several people come through the library who were working on patents, and they're inventors, and this is very uncomfortable. Uh -huh. yeah. So they're working on patents, and they come, to, there was one guy in particular, he's like, I'm leaving for Brazil today, and I need this, this prototype printed, and I'm like, Okay, you obviously don't know how long it takes to 3D print things, but let's see what you got. And so he shows me the, the model, and he's like, I've got a guy in China who, can, who engineered this for me, and I've got a factory tooled, ready to pump these suckers out if I can get uh, initial investment. And I'm like, okay, show me the prototype. And it was a modified chip clip. And I'm like, okay, that's small and printable. And it was, it was right when... Uh, Snowden released all of the NSA spying stuff, and it was a clip that went over the computer on your laptop. And all I could think of was, just use a piece of tape. But he was dead set on this thing being like revolutionizing uh, private safety. And so he's like, I need this prototype now because some people are super interested in it. I've got, I've got the manufacturer, I've got the designer, and now I've got investors. And I'm like, who's gonna invest in this thing? That sounds crazy. Okay, and like, mind you, this is like week one of us having a 3D printer, like our first one. And I'm sure some of us have sob stories about the 3D Systems Cubex Trio not working out of box. But we had that sucker working finally, so I printed it out for him. And, it, and he took three prototypes with him, and he did a pitch to his investors. And then he comes back, like super tanned and happy from Brazil, like a month later. He's like, hey, it worked. Um, they're going to listen to my pitch. And I'm like, oh, you never told me about it. He's like, oh yeah, so I got on the show Shark Tank. And so he went on Shark Tank with these, with these uh, printed prototype chip clips that he was going to put on laptop computers to prevent, you know, NSA spying. Uh, 
with, with these prototypes that he printed at the library for like 30 cents. And so it, they, they ripped them apart on Shark Tank, but so many people were like, hell yeah, that's a great idea, I want a clip for my computer. So the pipeline was completed, like he had, he had in a weird order, but he had <laughs> he'd gone from like design and concept to getting the factory, to getting the patent, he seriously patented this checkbook thing, to getting the prototype, to getting the investor, and like we were, the 3D printer and the library were an integral part in his, in his pipeline. As weird as it was, but it worked. So, um, this is open to the whole panel, but I think Diego and, and Robin would be particularly interested in this. Um, what more could both the private and public sector be doing to close the workforce skills gap, or are we, we already there? Well, actually, I have one more thing to say for your comment, too, if that's okay. Please. Um, you know, I think one of the areas that we've been really focusing is investing in sector strategies where you get employers um, in a region that have similar needs together and they can agree on what skills do they need for their um, for their businesses and then when you align that with K through 12, your career and technical education system, your community colleges, and so the community colleges are talking to the employers and the employers are saying, hey, can you develop a curriculum that matches what we need and, and you know, and, and again, this is the, the ideal gold standard of when this all works together, but that's something that we've had different grant competitions and the Workforce Act as well is trying to lift up sector strategies as a solution to the, the skills pipeline. Um, so sorry again. What was, what was your last question? No, no, no that's okay. Um, it's what more could both the oh. private and public sector be doing to bridge the workforce yeah. skills gap? Well, um, again, <coughs> the, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Um, key members of the boards that are created by that act are businesses and private private sector members, um, and they are critical um, to making this work. I mean, if you if you don't know what they need, um, and then businesses need. Um, you know, what are you then training individuals for to fill? Um, you know, are you sending people down dead ends where you know, there are no jobs and, and you're just sending, they've wasted time and money, you know, consumers have wasted time and money on these programs. Um, and so the boards were strengthened again through this act, so we're very excited about that. Another question that we wrestle with is, you know, how, um, you know, there are the public dollars for federal, for uh, workforce training, and how do you get and encourage more um, apprenticeships, and which is where more employers are offering skin in the game and, and, and um, contributing money to, to skills um, training, on the job training. Um, so we've had a huge apprenticeship push as well. Um, we had, um, announced $175 million uh, last fall, I believe, um, which large chunk is going out to advanced manufacturing. Um, Congress um, just approved, which is very exciting, a landmark investment for $90 million for apprenticeships. Um, but again, we're, trying, we're, we're wrestling with this question and trying to incentivize more private engagement. But also, um, just sitting at the table and sitting down with people is, is really critical. Great. Um, you got a question? Yeah, go ahead. Please. I just want to make sure that I understood. Be sure to speak up. I want to make sure that I understood what Theo was saying about, like, in a manufacturing setting, about, um, like, an employee using an extruder versus, like, a 3D printing machine and, and potentially needing to have more skill to control that. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what what I meant is that the 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 way to interface with a 3D printer is completely different than the way that you will interface with a more traditional manufacturing equipment. So, for example, a, a numerically controlled machines, including 3D printers, your interaction with them is normally through some sort of computer or, or, or graphical user interface, whereas the traditional machine, you just pull levers and push buttons. and So, it, so the, the interaction is different. And also, when when something goes wrong, uh, say a machine a part is, uh, has some defect or something, uh, figuring out what caused the problem is, is different uh, from, uh, say, a 3D printer where you probably have to trace it back to the, to the, CAD mo the, the computer model or, or probably something that got lost in the file translation or whatever. Whereas if it's a, a manual a, a drill or, or cutter, well, you did something wrong when, when you were using it. It's, it's a little bit more straightforward. Is it the same workforce that's transitioning? Or is it so, oh, uh, uh, potentially, yes. I mean, uh, 
depends on a lot of factors, uh, uh, age and, and uh, education. Uh, the, probably the, the one, the group that is going to suffer the most in that transition uh, is, is the one that, that uh, doesn't want to upgrade their skills, right? So, but, but if the person uh, or the individual has the, the drive and the, and the intellect to pick up these things, regardless of age, in my opinion, they can make the transition. Now, of course, 10, 20 years from now, a kid who's today playing a tech shop or the library, they'll have a leg up. I mean, because they, they, they play with this stuff, 3D printer, since they were little kids. So it's going to be more natural to them. But uh, uh, I think that anybody can make the transition, given enough uh, interest and drive. You guys are reading my mind. Um, I'm going to I'm going to throw it back out to you guys for a couple questions, but I just want to ask one really quickly since it follows perfectly on what we were just discussing. Do you all think we should be focusing on training the next generation or retraining our current workforce? And please, anyone, feel free to jump in. I would just say I think it needs to be everybody. I think if you look at 3D printing, one interesting thing, I mean, it's not a new technology by any means. It's been around since the 1980s, but... At least from my perspective, as somebody who works on public policy, I see that it's just now beginning to gain some real traction uh, in the private sector among anchor institutions like schools, museums, and libraries, uh, and among government decision makers at the state, local, and federal level. Uh, and so I don't think that young people have, I mean, young people don't have a prohibitively large uh, head start in leveraging 3D printers to innovate. So I think to, to wall off the, the innovative capacity of a whole cohort of Americans just because they happen to carry an ARP card or collect Social Security is doing us all a real disservice. I mean, we need to we need to harness the energy of the creative energy and the innovative capacity of people of all ages. I mean, I look at my my dad is 63, and he, you know he he traveled. He's a baby boomer. You know, he's a baby boomer. The baby boomers are retiring. And, you know, he traveled across the country in the 60s in a VW van again. You know, he he went across overseas and taught transcendental meditation. When these people retire, they're not really going to retire. I mean, they have a lot of pent-up energy. They're going to want to release it toward productive pursuits. And so why shouldn't we channel that energy toward building things through 3D printing, innovating through 3D printing? I think it's imperative that we do that. Yeah, Diego, is it worth teaching them right-click from left-click? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, I don't think it's an or issue. I mean, uh, you don't have to settle on this one. I mean, of course, the, the obviously, the approaches, the teaching methodologies, and even the, the purpose, right? If you're teaching a, a kid who's going to college uh, 3D printing, the, at least the idea is that he or she will apply that as, uh, and make it a profession, whereas if it's... Uh, a, 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 his dad uh, probably be more uh, for a hobby. It's, on la it's less likely that they are going to produce something for a workforce or for a company. It's m probably, probably, I'm saying it's more for a personal fulfillment. But uh, this is not an or issue. Uh, uh, the, I don't see why we have the, uh, uh, either the old dogs or the new kids. No, it can be both. It just uh, there has to be different approaches and, and different uh, outcomes. Adam? In, in my experience, both has been the most successful, especially both at the same time. Because if there are skills gaps, but all the skills exist in the same room, they tend to co-teach each other, especially around a really fun project. And there's something sort of universally wonderful and novel about 3D printing that sort of strips away any layers of, of disinterest or, and sort of reignites that curiosity. It's just so new to both kids and older adults, it's that when you, I'm teaching them, they just sort of all open up to that same sort of level of, of curiosity and interest because it's just such a new, cool thing, and they can really sort of explore and ask questions without feeling silly because there are some right answers, but most answers are this and that, or this or that, or all of these things together, and no one really has wrong answers except you should never touch the extruder when it's hot, that's always <laughs> a bad idea. But other than that, like it's an open ball game, and uh, it's just awesome watching them learn together. So you'll get senior citizens in with teenagers, and outside of the lab, they might hate each other, actively. <laughs> but inside the lab, all they want to do is just like print lightsaber hilts. And, and that's two things, that's something they share. And 
they'll do it together and it's super fun. So the H doesn't matter anymore. Just what's really fun, like what sort of really fun, cool thing can we do with this super cool new thing that's in front of me. Star Wars, bringing this all together. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, I'm going to start with this gentleman back here. Hi, Please. yes. Uh, I have 10 3D printers. And I can confidently say that I am making America great again. <laughs> because I have brought a lot of manufacturing here. I'm a product designer. Before I used to send uh, whatever design that needs to be manufactured to China. So inventors would come to me. And just the shipping back from China would be $50. And then I would have to wait three weeks. And the part would be wrong. And it would be redesigned. Now with my 3D printers, I'm able to create these parts within a matter of a few hours. And to address your questions about labor, and training, it's really whoever wants to. There's an old generation that doesn't want to. There's nothing you could do about it. Uh, I could understand the left right click thing. I was consulting General Dynamics years ago. The head of the M1 tank division did not know how to use a mouse. He didn't want to learn anything with computers. So there's nothing you could do when you run into that situation. You need to separate desktop pr printers from industrial printers. Now the skill le uh, required to run a 3D printer is not as uh, the learning curve, I should say, is faster than using the old traditional machines. If you have an industrial printer, you're not allowed to repair it. They're usually 100 to 500,000 to a million dollars, the industrial printers. You have to pay 10 to 15,000 a year just on maintenance for somebody to come out and fix it. You're not allowed to touch it. With the library, the, uh, and I have desktop printers too. I'm in Virginia, by the way. 3dhubs.com is a world uh, website where you can locally uh, find uh, 3D printers that have 3D small 3D printers or, or uh, industrial level, but I could repair my own printers. So I taught that myself. And uh, if I had traditional tools and so forth, I would have to hire technicians and so forth. So it really depends on what kind of 3D printer you have and what kind of uh, um, interest the person has in terms of what generation wants to learn. And just to announce next year, I am gonna open up a technical school in Virginia for 3D printing. Uh, I went to aviation high school had four periods of shop, I had a lot of hands-on experience, then I got a mechanical engineering degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and I learned more in the high school shop than I did at, at a $120,000 degree at, at that time. So I think that this vocational and uh, whatever the White House and government is doing, they really have to focus on a new generation to really go back to vocational hands-on to bring that manufacturing back this country. Great, thank you. Um, we have just a couple more minutes. One more question, um, and I may reserve it for myself. Let's see, do we have any congressional staffers in the room? One staffer? No? Okay. Well, then I'll allow you guys to ask the question then. I'll be generous. Um, go ahead. Okay. I just want to do a metaphor in your title, 3D printing and bridging. Okay. You're using the word bridging, which we 3D makers use all the time, in order to allow the filament to go across. So I think this is a metaphor for what we need to do with the workforce skills gap. We need some support structures. We need some meshes. Everybody who's using 3D printers knows what I'm talking about. You need something to hold up the people while they learn the skills. Scaffoldi. Great, great. Guys just like Adam are doing so just that. Um, and we're going to close in just one minute, but Adam, I know you have one other story of a friend of yours who came to the library. You were telling us on the phone. Oh, okay. And I want to kind of close with that so that everyone can have a, a feel good for the next, the next <laughs> panel. Did, did you ever get your, your pole, your, your cat piece? Yes. Okay, did it uh, work? Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Did, awesome. We, yeah, um, it took a couple hours. Okay. Uh, but thank you, Adam. Yeah. Good to see you again. And good to see you, Ara. Ara. Okay. Uh, the story she's referring to, my. Are we supposed to like, substitute names for. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess that's up to you. Okay, my friend Mike. He's probably in the lab right now. Um, Mike uh, is currently homeless. He. He lives on the streets, and Mike was one of my first students. When I, so when I first started teaching uh, 3D Printing 101 and 3D Modeling 101, uh, like three years ago, and 3D Modeling 101 consisted of, let's make a Tinkercad account, and we're going to make a Snoopy house. So you're going to take a block, and you're going to put a roof on it, group them together, you did it. Now let's print it. And that was it. That was the whole class. 
And it was great. Like, people had little Snoopy houses with their initials on them, and that was their thing. And Mike came to that class, and he made a Snoopy house, and, you know, it wasn't very good, but uh, he was super excited about it. He was so pumped. And he just never stopped. So he came to my classes dozens of times. And remind you, these are just repeats. Like, it's not like new material every time. I might have some new jokes or new stories, but, like, it's still the same program. But he just kept taking them over and over, and he just kept getting better and better. And over the years, we started, we just kept getting more and more printers. And it eventually got a little ridiculous when you'd walk into the library. You probably remember this. You'd walk into the, the digital comics where we used to be, and there were all these microbots sort of like crowded in this catastrophic like aircraft carrier at the info desk and making all this noise and and it, it was a mess so they gave we lobbied for it on space so that's where we got our, our fabrication lab and uh, first person through the door was Mike and I'm like Mike what the hell's up man how you doing he's like I'm, I'm ready to print some stuff so he was one of the first people I trained on the printer and I can teach you how to use a 3d printer in like under an hour it's not particularly difficult to get a model onto the printer and going. Everything after that is going to take more time because a lot of times you have to wait for it to break first and then be like, ah, now we're going to talk about why it's broken. But uh, Mike was there in the door and he had all these designs he'd been working on for years. And he showed me the designs and you could see that the skills improve over time. And I like to think it was from my class, but it probably was just from them playing around. And uh, I was happy to see that most of them were Star Wars related. And, but it was all jewelry. Like R2D2 necklaces, or like R2D2 earrings, or all this other stuff. And he just started printing away like crazy and making all this 3D printed jewelry that he had customized and started selling it on the street to people. And he still does that today. You see him all over town. And you'll have this incredibly unique jewelry that he's made, but he's like made it from point zero with an empty build plate on a computer all the way to where he's, you know, end point where he's pulling it off of the build plate. And he's done that all himself. Uh, almost all self-taught, but um, that's an entire new set of job skills that he learned at the library. And I didn't necessarily teach him all those skills, but I was I was there to kind of usher him in, like the wizard at the gate. Like, come on in, Mike, we've got all this stuff here. I can't hold your hand, man, but if you're willing to, you know, fail a whole bunch, eventually you're going to succeed and get something cool. So now he's got lots of some things that are cool. And uh, he'll sell them to you at a reasonable price if you see them on the street. Awesome. Thank you. If we could give our panel a round of applause.